Thank you for inviting me to Tromsø. The nature of work is changing. There are fewer jobs for life. Perhaps it used to be in the last century, in the industrial age, that you could work all your life for one company in a secure and safe job. And parents who experienced that last century, who want the best, of course, for their children, want them to have a secure and safe job for life. And they used to advise them to get a job in a bank or a local authority or the civil service. But we've seen what has happened to jobs in those sectors. There are fewer jobs for life. At the same time, younger people are more comfortable with the idea of having a portfolio career. The concept of a portfolio career was coined by the management consultant Charles Handy some 25 or 30 years ago, when he could see the future, the trends within the working patterns, to recognize that we would have a series of jobs, not just one job, and even simultaneously have two or three jobs on the go at once. And that is the reality for many young people now in the sector I work in, in the creative industries, where, for example, a young man might be in a band that isn't yet making money, but he's also a talented video maker working for a web designer. And he also spends some of his time in voluntary groups to change society. And so people are becoming much more comfortable with that. And employers' attitudes are changing too. It used to be that if your CV, your resume, showed that you had lots of jobs for short periods of time, that was a bad thing. That was a liability. Because that implied that you couldn't hold down a job. You were some kind of butterfly. But things have changed. And now that kind of CV or resume indicates that you're versatile. You can turn your hand to different things and you're adaptable in an ever-changing world. The barriers to entry are low. It's never been easier to start up a business. And this is particularly the case in the sector I work in, the creative and digital industries. So for example, if you wanted to make a TV show or a feature film many years ago, it was impossible for ordinary people to do because the cost of the equipment was so expensive that only corporations could afford it. But we've all seen the trends that technology has become ever, ever cheaper as it's become even more powerful. And nowadays, the cost of equipment to make even a feature film is accessible to most of us. And so we've seen a kind of democratization of technology where we have access not only to filmmaking equipment, but to computing power and many other aspects of technology which is cheap and accessible to all of us. There is also a democratization of distribution. No longer, do, uh, no longer is distribution controlled by just a few media companies. We all have access to it through the internet where we can share our content our material, our creativity, and our ideas through various online platforms, usually for free. But it's not just about production and distribution. The means of exchange have become democratized too. So that even a small business, a one-person business operating with a computer from their back bedroom can actually sell their products or services or content to countries all around the world in different currencies using e-commerce software or facilities such as PayPal. And so the opportunities given to us now are tremendous. We know these things in detail. We've all seen the trends in technology. We know that our mobile phones are powerful filmmaking equipment. But perhaps we haven't understood the depth of what it means for jobs and enterprise and our futures. 
Micro businesses make a macroeconomic impact. In the creative industries, many businesses, businesses are very small. Two or three people, less than 10 people, defines it as a micro business. And jobs are created, and that's a great thing. But I think our mindset is still in the last century. In other words, if an employer comes to a town and says they will build a factory and employ 500 people, it hits the media. The politicians are excited, and the general public uh, population understand what's going on. But if 500 micro-businesses each employ one extra person, that's still 500 jobs, but it doesn't hit the media. It doesn't get media attention, the politicians aren't excited, and these things are probably invisible to the ordinary public on the street. And so it was from this kind of frustration of my experience in Liverpool where this very phenomenon is happening that I wrote an article called the invisible sector, because it's as if this sector of micro-businesses is not given the credit it ought to have for the creation of jobs and the impact on the economy. Because all these people are employed, they're earning money, they're growing businesses, they're making profits, and they're paying taxes. At the same time, the age of information is changing the power balance in several different ways. We have more access to information than ever before. No longer are we controlled in what we can learn about. So it used to be that if you wanted good information, even 30 or 40 years ago, you had to go to the public library. And information was controlled by librarians. Now that's a scary thought. Nowadays, we can go to the internet and get an abundance of information of different quality, I accept, but information about anything we might want to learn about. And so the power balance has changed in many different ways. In education itself, schools and other educational institutions no longer hold a monopoly of power. Yes, schools and universities still do a great job in educating their students, but there's almost a parallel education system where we can choose what we learn, how we learn it, and when we learn it. And so we've become empowered in very different ways because of this age of information and the access we now have to an abundance of information. People are no longer willing to be simply passive consumers. Again, the world has changed dramatically. My auntie is 89 years old, and recently she got a new TV. And I was showing her how to use the controls. And I said, auntie, if you're watching a film and you need to take a break for some reason, just press this button and the whole film stops. Her immediate reaction was, but what about everybody else who's watching it? And that comment from my dear old auntie encapsulates the changes in society because she was brought up in a society in a time when everybody went to a cinema, probably a beautiful old cinema like this one here in Tromso, to watch a movie. Small towns had three or four picture houses and everybody went along on Saturday night to watch a film that the cinema chose at the time, the cinema chose to screen it. They were passive consumers. They had no other choices. The media was in control. But nowadays, we're not satisfied that, with that. We want to watch what we want to watch, when we want to watch it, on a device of our choosing. And we can binge watch, as I did with Breaking Bad. I missed the original series. I was a little bit behind the curve. But once I cottoned onto it, I watched it every night in my own choice, at my own pace on Netflix. 
People are no longer willing to be passive consumers. They also want to be involved. We no longer sit at home just watching the TV. We want to vote on the talent shows. And we want to comment on the political debates, sharing our tweets with other people watching the same program. And consumers also want to be involved in the creative process. And that's what crowdsourcing is all about. And that's a fantastic opportunity for businesses who no longer have to rely just on their own design department, but can take designs from the crowd. They can invite the public, their consumers, and potential customers to be involved. So it allows people to be involved as consumers, and it provides opportunities for businesses. And there are many other ways in which people want to be involved. As investors, through crowdfunding, people have an opportunity to invest their small amounts of money in supporting a project with a donation or investing for a return on capital. And again, this provides fantastic opportunities and changes the, the balance of power for the businesses using crowdfunding because no longer are they dependent on the say-so of the banks or some kind of equity investor but they can now go to the crowd and are less dependent on one individual powerful investor when many people are donating or investing small amounts. So again, the opportunities are massive and the power balance has changed. And so we have opportunities like never before to combine our creative passion with smart business thinking. That's a combination that I call t-shirts and suits. That's my analogy, my metaphor, for how creative people can take charge of their own lives, can make a business out of their creativity by adapting some smart business thinking. And so we can, we have opportunities like never before to empower ourselves through creative entrepreneurship. We can become less dependent on the state and more fit for the future. And that applies to arts organizations as well. And politically, this is neither right nor left. Maybe we need a new dimension, a new way of thinking about the opportunities to take control of our lives, to empower ourselves by using creative entrepreneurship in ways that give us new opportunities to make us less dependent on the state, less dependent waiting for jobs to arrive and taking control of our own lives. And so in conclusion, I would say creativity plus enterprise leads to empowerment. And for those of you who choose to combine your creativity with smart business thinking, I wish you every success. Thank you.